I wanted to start by talking a little bit about why you're here in Africa. Um, you gave a pretty rousing speech this morning at uh, Nairobi University. I'll take that as a compliment. You worked the crowd <laughs> like I haven't seen you work the crowd before. You danced a little bit. Um, what is it about Jill Biden in Africa? What does Africa do to you? You know, I mean, I feel really comfortable here. You know, this is my sixth visit to the continent, and um, you know the. Um, the Monica made me feel so wonderful, and of course, being at uh, at a university with um, students, I just feel right in my element. But re really, the reason to come here, as I said, this is my sixth visit, mm -hmm. and I started in 2010, and I was working on girls' education and uh, you know women's empowerment and health issues. Mm -hmm. I came back in 2011 because of the horrible, horrible famine and went to refugee camps. And so I saw what was important. I worked with PEPFAR and with USAID. And um, so it just, I feel, you know, very, like I'm continuing to work mm -hmm. on what we've been doing. And then of course, when everybody came to Washington and we had the summit with the African leaders and I think, um, I don't know, it's uh, the spouses, really bonded together and we were working on cancer then and um, and so we said we're going to keep in touch and we're going to you know zoom and we're going to have phone calls and and I mean there was a real sisterhood and uh, and then when the invitation came from Monica and she said oh you know come to Mi to Namibia and I said I might and so anyway when you know with Joe and with democracy and um, with what's going on in the world, I thought there's no better place to go than to go to Namibia, whose democracy is just 40 years old, and to encourage the youth to get involved, stay involved, fight for their democracy, just like I feel we're doing in the United States. We cannot take things for granted because it's such a precious system of government. We can't be complacent. We have to keep fighting for it. And you're in Kenya now. Yes. And one of the issues you want to focus on here is the drought. Yes. What do you hope to accomplish uh, by uh, bringing attention to that issue? Well, I'm hoping that, you know, that people do pay attention. And uh, they to see the drought and what I saw before with um, just children who have no food and they can't, uh, they can't have livestock, they can't grow crops, you know, and to be starving. And so I'm trying to really create awareness and, and just see how far things have come in the 10 years really that I've been gone. What is different about this time and these promises of deeper engagement with Africa from the Biden administration? Joe Biden, he's the difference. He's committed. He told the leaders of Africa that we would be equal partners and that he would support them and that he would help with whatever they needed. There would be an exchange of whatever it is, whether it's ideas, whether it's something that they need, like certainly they need, you know, f food when the, dr with the drought and, uh, and support and respect. So I think we have to keep working together globally to keep our democracies. Now he's supposed to visit this year also. Mm -hmm. uh, will you come back with him when he visits later in the year and when <laughs> exactly think, is he coming? I'm taking life one day <laughs> at a time. <laughs> I would love to come back because I visited I think I counted 13 countries mm -hmm. and you know in six visits that's that's a lot but you know one thing I've learned is that each country is so different the people are different, the culture is different, the religion is different, the language. Um, and it's so interesting. And, uh, but you know, we all share so many of the same values. And I think that's important, that we're looking for stability, a stable government. Uh, we're looking for, you know, representation of the people. Um, we're looking for leaders who have character and integrity. And, uh, and that's what I, I think that we want to foster, and they do too. You know, it's not like we're isolationists, like um, 
we were becoming in the last administration, we are reaching out and saying, hey, we're a global society. Take our hands. Let's do this together. We're speaking on the anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Can you take a moment to reflect on that anniversary? You went to Ukraine last I year, did. met with President Zelensky's wife. Uh, and you we, were with me. Yes, you I know was. when we went and we saw her, I mean, it was just such an emotional moment um, to see her and then to go into that school and talk with the mothers and the children who had, who had been underground for weeks and, and they didn't have food and they were afraid to go outside. And um, you could see the children in the, you know, how kind of um, shy they were and, you know, downcast. And you could see the effect of war on the children. And I think we thought then, gee, you know, how long can this go on? And here we are a year later. And look at what the Ukrainian people have done. I mean, they are so strong and resilient and they are fighting for their country. And uh, I just, you know, we're all hoping that, um, you know, that this war is over soon because we see every day the damage, the violence, the horror on our televisions and we just can't believe it. Have you been in touch with uh, President Zelensky's wife recently in the run-up well, to the anniversary? Recently, but, um, mm -hmm. Did you send a message with the president when he went to Kiev? Well, he, he knows. You know, I think I've met with Elena now like two or three times, and he would always tell her, you know, that I was thinking about her and the children because it's so tough on their kids. Can we take a moment now and have you just reflect a little bit on uh, former President Jimmy Carter? Mm. what he means to you, the Biden family, um, share a fond memory of him, oh, given sure. the news? Well, you know, Joe was uh, way back, I guess, really, when I met Joe or when I was just married to Joe. And Joe was, um, I think he was his honorary campaign chairman. And so Joe, and he came to Delaware and he campaigned for Joe. And, of course, so I met him way back then. And then we've, you know, just kept in touch over the years. And then, you know, when we, the night of our inauguration, right before, they called and said congratulations. And it meant so much to me and to Joe. And, of course, we went to their home uh, in Plains, Georgia, and visited with them. So it's, you know, it's not just that here are two presidents, it's here are two friends. And uh, actually four friends. Mm -hmm you know, that have really um, supported one another over the years. And uh, so as uh, so now, you know, pretty emotional time. I mean, uh, because look at look at his legacy, you know, look at their legacy, what they built together. And um, I just think they're both really just icons. They're just, you know, I just admire both of them so much. I'm curious if Jimmy Carter's name came up in any of your conversations here in Africa because the Carter Center played a big role yeah. in eradicating guinea worm disease in Africa. It was considered endemic in Kenya at one point, mm -hmm. and now it's pretty much gone. Well, Carter's see, that's like the perfect example of something that, he, yeah. you know, he's done. I mean, really, he was such a humble man, right? He, he didn't go out and shout, like, look what I've done. And he just did it. He just did the work. Now let's talk about 2024 a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> is there any reason for any of us to think that he is not running again? We've heard him say several times that it is intention. It is his Are intention to run. Are you not this story? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many times does he have to say it until you believe it? So he, then, our go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, he he says he's not done. He's not finished what he started. And that's what's important. And I think, uh, look at all that Joe has has done, has accomplished. I mean, he brought us out of the chaos, and he did that. He was elected because people wanted steady leadership. And I think they saw that in Joe, and they saw his character. They saw his integrity. 
and he came into office, he knew, you know, what he wanted to do. And he knew people were suffering from the pandemic. And people, I mean, I was going and packs, passing out food boxes. People were starving. They didn't have food. And people were afraid. There was such fear. And, um, and so he came up with the American Rescue Plan to help kids get back to schools. And, he, you know, the things that bringing broadband to all the United States so that all kids have internet. You know, building up schools, getting our kids back to schools, um, building our infrastructure. Look at our roads and our bridges. Look at health care and what we've done. I mean, it's people are just starting to see all of this come to fruition because it was voted on before. And the CHIPS Act, you know, that we will now build the chips, the microchips here in the United States that we really import from other countries. I mean, he's done so much. And um, Darlene, he's just not done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so is all that's left at this point is just to figure out a time and place for the announcement? Pretty much. Okay. Um, there is a mystique about you that you are very influential with the president that it, you he will listen to what you say if you were, if you were to say <laughs> because of <it> his wife <laughs> are you are you the decider um, if you were to no. say joe i think you should do x or i think you should no. not do y will will he will he listen of course he'll listen will to me i mean he's... because we're we're you know a married couple and if i say joe i think you should do this and you know i mean we just it's a it's a marriage. I mean, it's um, hopefully it's a love affair. Uh, you know, it's a relationship. It's a friendship. It's all of those things. So um, to say that we don't talk about things would be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, he my life is very different from his life in that you know I go off to school, and of course I come home every day and tell him this happened in school or this happened to my student, or like when I go home now, and I'll tell them, tell him everything about Kenya and Namibia and who I talked to and what I learned and what I saw. So that's not like, you know, Joe's his own man. He makes up his own mind, believe me, darling. <laughs> As you know, there have been lots of questions about his health and fitness and whether he should run for a second term. <laughs> You recently pulled out of a couple of your public appearances because you were feeling under the weather. Yes. You came down with laryngitis last year. I did. Um, you've sounded hoarse at various points on this trip. Mm -hmm. How is your health? My health is great. I mean, you know, I, um, I went through the, the cancer scare, of course, and went through most surgery. And, um, and, you know, like everybody else, I think our d immune systems were down a little bit. And... I mean, I am seeing like hundreds of people a day. So the fact that I picked up something, like our doc said to me, because I, I said, Doc, why do I have this? You know, I eat right, I exercise every day. And he said, Jill, for two years we wore masks. Our immune systems went down. So, of course, if you're into all these classrooms and or meeting people, of course you're going to pick up something. So, And I keep going. I don't want to stop. So... Maybe I should just, I don't know, stay the bed, <laughs> you know, stay the day in bed and drink coffee. I don't know. And I've, I've heard you say on several occasions that the worst three words anyone can hear is the phrase, you have cancer. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit what was going through your mind when the doctors said to you that the lesions they removed were cancerous? What, what, uh, what were your thoughts? Well, it was a little harder than I thought mm -hmm. um, to hear those words, of course. I mean, I've heard them for so many members of my family. And um, and I, you know, I just thought, oh, it's just something on my eye, you know. But then they said, no, you know, we think it's basal cell. And then they found, and I said, well, before we go out of this appointment, I also want you to check, you know, on my chest. And, and they said, that's definitely basal cell. So I knew I had to get it removed. And um, so I, I'm lucky. Yeah. Believe me, I am so lucky that they caught it, mm -hmm. they removed it, and, um, and I'm healthy. 
That uh, kind of cancer is uh, usually caused by exposure to the sun. Mm -hmm. What are you doing differently uh, to prevent a recurrence or lessen the... Oh my gosh, I'm putting sunscreen on Are you every bumping up the SPF? <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. You know, um, so I'm being very careful because, you know, you know, I'm an out, I love to cycle outdoors and I love to Beach. exercise. Beach, yes, and uh, one of my favorite places in the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm being extra careful. Can you put your teacher's cap on for a minute? Sure. Um, is it in the best interest of children to limit what they can read, uh, what they learn in classrooms, what types of type of history they're they're taught? Where do you not fall in, on that? not in the United States? No, no. I mean, I don't believe in banning books. Um, I know I have complete autonomy in my curriculum. I think the teachers and the parents can work together and decide you know, what the, what the kids should be taught. I mean, the parents, the teachers, the administrators, they all have a stake in kids' educations. And you know, Darlene, that's what I've seen as I've traveled to God knows how many schools I've been to. I see, you know, parents being involved in a positive way in their kids' educations. It's not the us and the them. It's let's work together. What can we do to make education better? for all of our children. Now, if the president can see himself as president when he's 86 years old, do you see yourself still teaching when you're 86 years old? Oh my gosh, I never thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you given any thought to how much longer you will continue to teach? As long as I, um, I know that I will know when, it, when it's enough, but it's not yet. Mm -hmm. I still have such passion and um, I love going into the classroom. I mean this whole trip I've been texting with my students mm -hmm. and um, and actually Darlene I texted with one today. She was a freedom fighter in Ukraine and I said I wanted uh, today especially to um, text her to tell her I was thinking about her. But you know uh, they're texting with me every day so I'm not ready to give up that yet. I mean if Teaching brings me such joy. Um, I'll know when. You taught on Tuesday before the flight over here. Mm -hmm. What did you do about your class yesterday? Uh, yesterday I had someone go in and cover with me. SF. Four. Yes, but I made up all the lesson plans. Everything was there. And, you know, we'll fly. We'll get in Monday night at 3 in the morning. And I'll be in the classroom 8 o'clock on Tuesday.